Kaya nga na jerp din ang nunak, nunak wangin yan, kalad din wangin, ngarin yan, ganing nga ngarin, maman din ang nunak kaya wa. Buru man, nunak kalad din wangin, kurung kong kalad din, bide kalad din wangin, kalad din wop na wop na kanin, nunak kanin, nunak kanin din. Buru man, nunak wot ko nunak kalak, nunak po din nunak wot, maman din ang nunak kaya wa. Nala ko ramot nunak ko mo din ang nga nga lai ay, man jerp jerp din ang nunak kaya wa. So may the good spirit be with us and, and watch over us during this presentation. This is called the Wajak section of the Nyungar language group. That's the good spirit to keep everyone safe. When we're sharing this time, conversation, sharing food and sharing drink with each other, we're doing something all of our ancestors have been doing for thousands of years. And in our case, in my, my people's case here, 2,000 generations. We hope that the good spirit will take each and every one of you safely back to your workplace and at the end of the day, take his oar safely home. We are by the river, we call that the Bilya. I will do a little song for you and uh, hope the, um, the, 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 the song and the pleasantness links us in lines uh, right across this country and hope you can link into it as well. Bilya kurling kurling ye kwopen kwopen kurling ye ngala ngala buji ye bilya kurling uwaden ye Ngala ngala buji ye kwopen kwopen buji ye ngala ngala buji ye nganyu kuling bili jini ye Kaya wa mama jinang nunuk ngala jep jinang nunuk kaya I'd like to thank the committee for Perth and the Marion and the team for requesting and welcomes to countries In our culture it's a sign of respect and that's uh, all of us regardless of where we're from it's our greatest asset Kaya may the good spirit be with you Thank you, Richard, for that welcome to country, and I acknowledge that we're meeting on Wajuk country. Just a few people in this room today had the pleasure of having lunch with Richard yesterday at Le Mans, where he shared his journey as an Aboriginal activist in the beginning, and now someone who's working very strongly with his community and with the white community to create a place for us all. So thank you, Richard, really appreciate it. So welcome to our second Perth In Focus event for 2017 and this is a really important opportunity to share with you the results of the 2000 person survey that Ipsos conducted for us for the Bigger and Better Beyond the Burn project. Uh, already this morning I've done ABC, ABC News, Channel 9, uh, spoken to a Fairfax reporter so there's a lot of interest in how Perth is faring post boom and post election. And there's some sobering things there for policymakers, which Sean Griffiths, our keynote speaker from Ipsos, will talk to you about today. Ultimately, Bigger and Better Beyond the Boom is about creating an economic diversity strategy for the Perth and Peel region, so that we have not only a vibrant community, but also a prosperous one. And I think we've ticked the vibrancy in the last decade with all of the changes and new investment that has been made, and now we're hard at work on what the economic future looks like. Can I welcome our VIPs, uh, the Directors of Committee for Perth, our Chairman John Langelant, who will sneak in later, uh, John Smolders, Michael Schock, Stephanie Buckland, John Nicolau, uh, welcome to all of you. And to the elected members and officials from a number of local governments across Perth and Peel, really pleased that you are here as well. I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of you who have taken tables. I know that in this marketplace, uh, getting money, extra money for lunches uh, and bringing clients and some of your uh, workers and um, uh, stakeholders is tricky. So thank you to Amana Living, Giorgio, John Holland, the Lester Group, Market Force, Rio Tinto, Telethon Kids Institute, and our funding partners, PwC and a City of Wanneroo, who are on the Bigger and Better Beyond the Boom journey with us. So aside from undertaking the survey, which we'll share with you today, we also released Fact Base 52, where we looked at the higher education and vocational training sector, particularly to understand how we could get more international students studying here in Perth. And there are a number of barriers to increasing uh, our level of participation. So the, the ranking of the universities matters, the marketing of the destination also matters, the ability to get work or work placement, 
but particularly having an urban experience is something that students are really looking for and Melbourne has been hard at work at that for over a decade. So yes, there has been some new projects announced for student housing uh, coming into the CBD, but then the challenge will be how do students get from the CBD out to their university of choice without having to buy a car, because that'll only add to congestion and certainly add to their cost of living as well. We are underway with two other pieces of research. So we're going to be examining the tourism sector with a view to how do we actually get more of the tourism market, particularly the international tourism market. And we're going to start a piece on ageing as well. So uh, they're pieces to watch out for in the next couple of months. On Saturday, I just depart from my international study tour and I'm going to be doing uh, nine cities in 19 days, so it's a frantic pace. And uh, I'm going to be looking at how other cities stay competitive in this global world, particularly where cities, it's a city to city competition as much as it is a country to country competition. So we'll be sharing those results uh, later on this year. So today we are going to have lunch and I'm going to hand over to Tony Monaghan from the brand agency who's going to run uh, the introductions to Sean and then the panel session so that I can sit on the other, mic other side of the microphone for a change. So Sean, when he's finished his keynote presentation, will be joined on the panel by Lisa Kalzak from uh, Rewa, Jay Watson from Westpac, Ian Martinus from the City of Wanneroo and myself. And we're going to reflect from sector and professional perspectives on what we heard out of the survey results and then of course open it up to questions from the floor. And Russell Lester will be giving the vote of thanks on your behalf at 2.20 so that we can have you out of the room on time. So on your tables today you've got an information brochure about Bigger and Better Beyond the Boom and who's involved, who the funding partners are and I have to say we are absolutely delighted to be working with PwC as our major funding partner. So Justin Carroll and Nadia Van Domlen are chair and deputy chair respectively of the project steering group and we have got a great group of people working with us and I hope to have an announcement very soon about a new project uh, funding partner that's come on board as well in another sector that isn't yet represented. So in the meantime, enjoy your lunch and your fellowship and uh, Tony will be back up after. I uh, hope you're all enjoying your lunch. It was uh, very nice. Well, now we get down to the interesting part of the afternoon. This is, um, as Marion said, this is the first of the presentations of Bigger and Better Beyond the Boom. It's a two-year research project being undertaken by the Committee for Firth, looking at sort of drilling down and to look at the economy and see why we have this spike and fall, why we go boom bust all the time. Surely we could have learned something. We've been doing it for decades now, but we're hoping that we'll come up with some solutions um, that will solve those issues and, and point towards areas that can be diversified. So um, Sean Griffin from Ipsos has carried out the research for us as it was 2,000 people living in the Perth Peel region, aged between 18 and 80, asked about essentially how are they feeling? How's life treating them? How are they, you know, st economically, financially? Uh, is their job going to be replaced by a robot? Are they worried they need to be reskilled? Do they have enough skills to keep going? And uh, financially, can they manage if there's any sort of stress, if there's any increase in the cost of living, which we know is uh, rising quicker than uh, basically our wages are rising at this point in time, is very, very close to zero growth. So it's a very interesting finding. I've been lucky enough that I've had a look at them, and uh, I would like to introduce Sean. He's an accomplished commercial manager with 20 years' experience working across a range of regional and global roles spanning consulting, research, strategy, planning, and analytics. In recent years, Sean has occupied senior roles in running strategy and digital marketing for businesses in the financial service and the consult consulting sectors. As general manager of Ipsos, Sean is working to help clients understand how to capitalise on the commercial and social elements, opportunities of a post-boom Perth market. With a diversity of skills and experience across sales, marketing, analytics, operations, e-commerce and IT, Sean has a unique understanding of the challenges facing business and government in the digital age. And I'd like to welcome Sean to the stage to make his presentation and the findings of that survey, which I think is going to give us all quite a bit of food for thought. Please, welcome Sean. 2007 and the end of the global financial crisis. Some 40% of all households in Perth have suffered some form of disruption by way of redundancy, career change or industry change as a result of the shifting fortunes of the state. After such a long 20 year boom, it's perhaps unsurprising that such a large proportion of households were actually affected by its end. What we typically tend to find is that at the end of any boom, the distortions that you see in asset prices, in, uh, in salaries 
and in uh, uh, and in other things tend to uh, give way to uncomfortable households. People don't adjust to uh, the, the changing times, and so as the economy, the economy begins to return to trend, we tend to find households that suffer a degree of pain as a result. So after a 20-year boom, where we have a generation of Western Australians that have perhaps been unaccustomed to what normal times actually are, it's no great surprise that the, the pain facing Western Australia is perhaps greater than it may have been. Against that backdrop, the Bigger, Better and Beyond the Boom project has been formulated to help to build a base of, of evidence that will assist government and uh, business decision makers to help to plan for growth beyond the boom. As a starting point for that project, Ipsos was commissioned to undertake a, a study into 2,000 Western Australians in Perth and Peel to really get a, an understanding of how their attitudes, perceptions and behaviours were faring beyond the boom. Undertaken in April of this year, ahead of the uh, recent uh, federal budget and the state elections, we sought to explore 118 different measures that related to all sorts of things about Western Australians' behaviour. We looked at how they defined success in life, what they thought about their industry, where they thought their industry was going. We talked about uh, what they look for in their work and how they, they um, are thinking about uh, things over time. We asked for whether or not their household has been dis disrupted as a consequence of the boom. And we also looked into um, what their household finances were actually faring like. The instruction that was given to us as part of the brief was really to let the data take us where it may. We weren't given any particular direction, we just needed to find out what was happening out there. So in order to ensure that we had a representative set of views, we structured the, the group of people that we talked to by age, gender and geography to make sure that there was a, a good representation of everybody across the uh, entire of the Perth, uh, Perth market. We also put in place quota controls to ensure that the working, non-working and retiree populations were accurately represented in our data. And ultimately, we took the census data and we weighted all the information back so that we were very, very sound with the body of in information that we had on which to explore. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is the results of that study. How is life different in Perth beyond the boom? How is the workforce changing? And we see a lot of this in the, uh, in the study results. What are some of the hints that we might have as to how we can grow beyond the boom, particularly in relation to productivity? And at the end of all of that, how do we understand the changing behaviours that we see? What's accounting for those behaviours and what's driving them? And ultimately, where is that going to take us as decision makers and policy uh, makers? And what are we going to do about it? So how is life different beyond the boom? If 40% of all of us out, uh, of all households have been affected in some way by the end of the boom, what that actually means is that one in five of you will come from a household where somebody suffered a redundancy. One in seven of you will have come from a household where somebody's actually had to change industry as a result of the shifting fortunes of the state. And a third of you will have come from a household where people have changed careers. That is a massive quantity of disruption in a very short time and it will leave households feeling um, rather dour and rather uncertain. And we certainly see that in the results. Only 40% of Western Australians feel as though they are better off than they were five years ago. And off the back of a boom, that's a big change. We also find that little under half of uh, all the people out there expect their quality of life to actually then improve over the course of the next five years. But perhaps more so than any other figure that came out of the research, the thing that surprised us most was the massive 72% of people that have no expectation about real wages growth moving forward. That is, they don't expect their salary to increase beyond inflation. It's a pretty, uh, pretty negative set of, uh, set of sentiments, and unfortunately that's going to create a real anchor on the economy of Western Australia and, uh, and on the behaviours of households. So we see that uh, echoed in the uh, Ipsos Issues Monitor that we collect on a quarterly basis. Over the last five years, quarter on quarter, we've seen a, a material increase in the influence that the economy and unemployment have on people's views of what the issues are out there and on their behaviours. And it did feel as though mid last year things perhaps were getting better, but we have seen that sentiment has dipped back again as we move into 2017. So the interesting thing about the end of the boom is that it conferred a lot of prosperity on a lot of houses. So when we start to look at the results uh, from the research, we find uh, this picture uh, this picture echoed. It's actually wealthier households, the wealth on which was conferred from them by the boom, that have tended to be those that were most affected by its end. 
higher income households were far more likely to be disrupted as a result than, uh, than lower income households. But the really interesting thing about those higher income households is that they've adapted quite well. <laughs> Two thirds of them now feel as though they're actually better off than they were five years ago. And 70% of them are feeling good about their quality of life improving in the next five years. So that's a real positive. And a lot of that is underpinned by the fact that there's job security resuming amongst that population. And that's a higher income population. That's people that have been through change and have come out the other side. But the challenge is that amongst that, uh, that higher income population, there's still a massive quarter of them that don't feel as though they, uh, they are better off. They've got stuck. And they feel that their current income is now insufficient to meet their needs. And that's against the, the face of a, a, an environment where the story of the boom was always one of two economies of the people that benefited from the largesse of the boom and the people that struggled under higher prices and higher asset values uh, of the boom and who seem to be suffering a greater proportion on the tail end of that as the economy has dipped. So if we look at lower income households, what we find is some real fragility. Only a quarter of them actually feel like they're better off, uh, sorry, a fifth of them actually feel like they're better off than five years ago. And only 40% of them expect that their quality of life will continue to improve moving forward. That sets a tone for these households. And a lot of that, again, is underpinned by the fact that they feel that their jobs are insecure. And that is the thing that we see rising as an issue in our Ipsos uh, monitor. So between the higher income households and the lower income households, we've got a lot of fragi uh, fragility out there. 60% of people feel like they would struggle under just a 5% increase in costs. When we first looked at that number, we thought it was unbelievably high, but there's been some uh, results that have come out from the RBA, the Reserve Bank, in just the last few weeks that have talked about 40% of households facing problems if under just a 1% increase in interest rates. But the story of the boom and its end hasn't filtered out equally to all industries. And what it's left, with, uh, left for us is a very, very large gap in expectations. What we find in the mining and construction sector is probably what we, intended, we, what we thought we would find. Very high levels of personal redundancy between 15 and 20%. Large volumes of total disruption. But in those industries, the volume of change and the hard pill has been swallowed. And as a consequence, what we see across the results is that sentiment is actually picking up. Those people that are left in employment are feeling more positive and they have quite a moderate uh, expectation of real wages growth moving forward. That contrasts to the ancillary industries that assisted uh, mining and construction, your admin, your IT, your utility sectors. They've suffered similarly in, in the, uh, the wake of the boom in terms of redundancy and total disruption. But they have been left feeling less comfortable at the end of the boom and have the lowest expectations of real wages growth. But perhaps the really interesting part about, uh, about this analysis industry to industry is that it is when you look at education, healthcare, public administration and professional services. These are industries that haven't been disrupted as a function of the ending of the boom. The total disruption is about half that of mining and construction. And the problem that we have there is that their expectations of real wages growth continue to be very high. And no, point, no place is that more apparent than in some areas of public administration where we've had 2% levels of redundancy and 45% uh, of, of those people expecting real wages growth moving forward. So for the incoming government, there is undeniably a requirement to recalibrate expectations. So the end of a boom is always a time for, uh, for people to move on and return, uh, in many instances, return home. And if you look at the statistics about people leaving Western Australia, from about 2014, uh, we started to see a net outflow back to the east. And by mid last year, that was about 3,000 people a month. The reason why they were returning was all about better career opportunities, and that linked to better lifestyle. So when we look to, to tease that apart, what drives people moving is always income and jobs. What drives people to stay is about being near family, near friends, and familiarity. And for about 2 thirds of everybody living in Western Australia, after such a long boom, Western Australia is home and there's no desire to move. But the interesting thing, and probably the silver lining of the end of the boom, is that on the way in, people did not want to move to the regions to take advantage of the opportunities. And what we see in the results at the end of the boom is that a massive quarter of the population would be happy to relocate 
to take advantage of that prosperity. So as we step forward, the challenges for, uh, for policymakers will not just be ones of dealing with a fragile economy, dealing with fragile households and rebasing expectations. One of the things that's really interesting about the nature uh, of studies like this is it gives you an indication of the shape of the workforce. And for those of you that don't deal with demographics every day, it's worthwhile pausing uh, for thought. At any given point in time, only 50% of the population actually works. And only a third of the population actually works full time. Now that's the base of, of the population that actually pays income taxes, that supports all the government services that we, we are provided with. And the challenge that exists for policymakers moving forward is that the ratio of workers to non-workers is changing. If we look back at 1970, the ratio of workers to, non uh, to retirees was 1 to 7.5. So 7.5 workers to every one uh, retiree. By 2010, that number had dropped to 5. And by 2050, it'll be 2.7 workers to every retiree. They are numbers that are going to have significant implications for the nature of how we shape policy, for the way we think about uh, taxation and revenue, and for the way we think about the delivery of services. And the big problem and, and the challenge perhaps for, uh, for business decision makers and policy makers is that they can't, those movements in the population come with confronting options. We can't just necessarily go out and ask people to work harder. We're going to have to deal with far more confronting decisions. Are we going to tax non-workers more? Are we going to change our level of service that we provide to the population? Are we going to ask people to work more years? Are we going to begin to tax assets instead of individuals or tax companies more? All of those choices are hard choices because they involve winners and losers in the population. Perhaps the only two options that we have is to either increase, uh, to avoid some of that pain, is to either increase skilled youth migration, to engineer your way out of the, the population changes, or to seek productivity gains. And the good news from the, uh, from the survey is that there's five areas that we've identified where some of those productivity gains can be found. But it's inescapable that we're going to have to confront some of these more difficult decisions moving forward. So the interesting thing about productivity is over the course of the last 10 years, productivity growth has slowed materially versus what it was uh, through the 80s and 90s. And the reason for that is partly because of the distortions of the boom, but largely uh, probably uh, because of the, uh, the petering out of the effects that were driving productivity in the first place. The computerization of the 80s and 90s that massively increased uh, workplace uh, efficiency and the move towards double income households that greatly increased work pl workplace participation. So if the future of productivity isn't just about getting workers to work harder, where are we instead going to find greater productivity? The first option that the, uh, the research tends to point to is, I was going to say exploiting, but taking advantage of our, uh, our retiree population. The interesting thing about retirees is that they are a large cohort of the population, and that's just going to continue to increase in line with these demographic changes. So with 18% of everybody above uh, 16, uh, being a, a retiree, there's a lot we can do in that space. And the most interesting thing about that population is a large proportion of them, a third, felt as though they were forced out of the workforce. And they weren't also ready to retire. So when you ask them about what they would like to do and what they'd be willing to do, 35% said, I would rather still be in the workforce. This wasn't as a supplement to their, uh, their volunteering, about a third of them volunteer but they wanted paid employment. And because that's such a big portion of people in the, the population, that has a massive impl implication for what we can do by way of productivity. But the interesting thing about these people is that they wanted jobs in the event that they could find an appropriate opportunity, that they could reduce their hours to part-time, and that they could get a, a greater level of flexibility in their workplace. And the fascinating thing for us is that makes them more like young mothers than any other group in the population. The second opportunity to increase productivity really is all about bringing non-workers back into the, the fold. About 13% of the working age population doesn't work, and that's excluding students and the unemployed. The primary reason why they're not working is because they have, uh, have childcare or elderly care um, responsibilities at home. But a massive 40% of these people actually want to work. So we're failing them in some way. The challenges that they find 
are really all around flexibility on one hand and experience on the other. The flexibility conversation is all about finding jobs that can mesh with their caring responsibilities and which pay enough to justify those caring responsibilities. Whereas then on the experience side of things, there's two camps. There's one about honouring the experience that people had before they went into the childcare years. And the second side of it is making sure that for those that didn't have experience, their value and their contribution to the workforce can still be recognised. As lifespans continue to increase, and what's driving some of those ratio changes is increasing lifespans and ageing baby boomers. As lifespans increase, it's a, a requirement for us to make sure that we take advantage of this population that wants to work, because otherwise the duration for which they're not working will be longer. The third area that the research pointed to by way of productivity was automation. And because of that massive change in, in uh, the ratio of workers to aged uh, people, there's a massive volume of investment going into automation globally. And it's a slightly different automation than what we saw in the 80s and 90s with, with computers and uh, the computerisation of the workforce. It's two things. It's the movement of um, technology and, uh, and robotics out of the factory floor and into job sites, hospitals, driverless cars uh, and work sites. And on the other side, it's the automation of intellectual property and processes and those decision trees that your lawyers and doctors and accountants have in their heads. Because as you automate those things, you can actually create, um, uh, you can actually remove requirements uh, for, for as many people in those sectors. And that's going to create a level of disruption, not only at the blue collar end of the workforce, but at the white collar end of the workforce. So automation is a double edged sword. It's going to massively increase what we're going to be able to do as a, uh, as a population but it's also going to create a massive level of disruption. And youth tend to see this. A third of people believe that their job today could be done by a machine. And if you look at the 16 to 34 year olds, that's almost 40%. So tapping into automation, particularly as a remote country or remote state like WA, um, is a great opportunity for us to consider for the future. The fourth area that, that the research pointed to by way of opportunity and productivity was all around training. Two things are happening in relation to, to training. One, people are seeing that their, their, life, uh, their working lives are changing. They expect to have disrupted careers. They expect to work more part-time work, uh, to, to do more part-time work. They expect to end up in multiple jobs and they expect potentially to have to work more hours to make ends meet. That's a different complexion to uh, the uh, generations before that came out of university and expected to work in one job. The disruption um, that, uh, that the training sector is going to need to fulfil is going to be that of a fragmented workforce and a changing workforce. And it's the volume of change that people are expecting that's fascinating. 40% of everybody out there already believes that they're going to need to retrain at some stage in their career in order to remain in the workforce. And throughout the research findings, we've got a lot of, uh, of different figures that underpin that. But people are uncertain. People believe their careers are going to, to go in multiple directions. And the problem that, uh, that goes hand in hand with that is that about 40% of people already don't feel like they're doing enough training to be able to support that outcome. And the fifth option, uh, option for, for addressing productivity is really around um, addressing congestion. Now, we've previously uh, been on, on stage uh, for other Committee for Perth uh, studies talking about the challenges of congestion and the challenges, uh, one of the challenges being that people and businesses don't necessarily want to respond. So whilst congestion is a material issue out there, and we see that in our Ipsos tracking monitor, we've earned ourselves a little bit of breathing room as a result of the end of the boom. One of the interesting things, though, is that, it's that the changes that we need to be made to address congestion are going to fall on governments to go it alone. And probably the biggest reason for that is when we talk to individuals, the average person has a commute time at the moment of 27 minutes, their commute tolerance is 43 minutes. Until that gap closes to zero, they're not gonna wanna change their behavior. So that means when we look at infrastructure and we look at building for the future, we need to do it now ahead of the market really um, wanting us to do it. So people will see pain associated with congestion but they won't necessarily be motivated to change their behaviours right now. So we've spoken a little bit about how um, life has changed beyond the boom 
how there's a level of fragility to, uh, to households out there. There's some need to rebase some expectations. We've pointed to the fact that there have been um, some massive changes occurring in the background to our population and they'll continue to, uh, to occur. And we've talked to some of the ways that we can address those through productivity. But the one thing that we haven't touched on is whether or not people are changing and what people want is actually changing. And so we sought to, uh, to explore that as part of this study. In the work that we do for our, uh, our clients, we're often asked to explain what seems to be aberrant behaviour from different populations and no more so than from millennials, where people struggle to understand um, why they're doing the things that they're doing. So if we talk to university graduates today, we're just as likely to find um, that they're out saving for multiple micro businesses as they are saving for a house. And that's a, a seismic shift compared to what they were doing just 10 years ago. So why is that behaviour changing? The question we posed was, do they actually want something different? And what we found was that no, everybody wants the same thing. It doesn't matter whether you're 18 or whether you're 80. People want to be in good health, they want financial security, they want to have time with their family and friends, and they want to have sufficient time for themselves in a busy world. But perhaps more interesting are the, the, the smaller things, the things that people said were slightly less important, but still important to them. And that's where we saw no differences. Millennials and, retire, uh, and older people were no uh, less likely to want to purchase property. They were no less likely to want to travel. We just didn't find differences between the generations in terms of what people were looking for. And that left us asking the question, well, why perhaps are those behaviours changing? We think that several things are going on. The first one is that working lives are getting materially longer. So if I look at my, uh, my father's generation, if you're a successful businessman, you might have retired at age 55 after 30 or 35 years in the workforce. If I look at my children, I can expect that they will be working 50, 60 or 70 years, depending on what happens to their life expectancy. So against the same set of criteria, wanting the same things as their grandparents, they're going to behave very differently. They're going to stay at home more and, and for longer. They're going to delay purchase decisions on housing. They're going to do things in relation to travel and spending behaviours that other people before them didn't necessarily do at those stages of their lives. And that's not because they want something different, it's because the world is changing around them. Now it's easy to think that that's just happening amongst the youth, but that's not the case. <coughs> Excuse me. Retirees are just as likely to be changing their tune. One of the things that always surprises me about the retirement age of 65 is that when it was introduced in 1909, the average life expectancy for a male was 54, and the proportion of the population that actually lived, to 60, uh, lived past 65 was only 4%. So this has been, the retirement ages have been a sacred cow that have remained with us for a very, very long period of time, against a lifespan now where the average male will live to 85. And if I read my actuarial tables right, I may very well be living to 98. That's a long retirement, and that's going to force government to make different decisions about how I need to fund that retirement, how I need to behave, and what I need to do. So it's not just that asset to income ratios are changing, and that's driving changing behaviours amongst youth. It's that the underpinning factors <coughs> are actually changing, both amongst, uh, amongst youth and amongst retirees. And that's disrupting uh, both government revenues and, uh, and service provision. Excuse me. Thank you. None of you need me to cough into my microphone again, I'm sure. So, where does all of that leave us? It leaves us with a, a strange old world, one in which there's not a lot of easy decisions for policymakers. There's a lot of disruption. Where we're going to get our revenues from and how we're going to provide services is going to be stretched in very, very different ways to what it historically was. So if we look at the research findings, we're left with this picture of, yes, there's some things we need to do in the short term. We categorically need to recalibr uh, recalibrate expectations amongst some industries, and we certainly need to be careful in the policies that we choose to take care of fragile households that for whom we need to build a level of resilience. But now is really the time for us to shift our focus. During the, the course of a boom, we inevitably spend our time dealing with the scarcity of the boom 
And in the wake of a boom, we inevitably spend our time dealing with the scarcity of revenue. What that can tend to do is take our, our focus off the structural shifts that are happening, and they're the things that are very apparent from this research. Both these changing nature of the population and the changing behaviours of people, which are going to stretch prod and focus in relation to our existing policies. So whilst we can solve some of our, our problems potentially by looking at those five areas of productivity gain uh, that we identified, there's going to be no easy runs moving forwards. We're going to have to deal with the difficult trade-offs around revenue, and we're going to have to deal with the difficult trade-offs around services. So it's not fun, fun times necessarily for policymakers, but it is time for us to take note. We need to be, have some clarity and some consistency around what's going to get taxed, who's going to get taxed, and how we're going to plug the gaps. We need to be, right now, making decisions about how we're going to trade off services, particularly as we know that service demand is going to grow for that ageing population. What's a fair distribution between workers and non-workers? And as we look to, to deal with the opportunities of automation, we look to deal with the opportunities of productivity, we need to ask ourselves the questions about how we maintain the, incentive, uh, the incentives to work for the workers that are already there. These are the challenges that are raised by the research, and they're the challenges that the Committee for Perth will continue to work on as we look to how we grow Perth bigger and better beyond the boom. Thank you. information in there I think and uh, a lot of us will be looking at some of those figures and going yes that I know people who have been affected by the boom you know I'm sure we all know somebody who has lost their job made redundant uh, has had made a career changer and have to retrain because of what has happened post the boom I'd like to now call uh, the panel up to the stage to take some questions I would like to invite Marion Fulker the CEO of the Committee for Perth Jay Watson from Westpac Sean Griffin from Ipsos Ian Martinus from the city of Wanneroo and Lisa Kazalak from Brewa as well, so. I'll kick off with just a few questions to each of them, or maybe one each, and then there are some roving mics if you would like to, so the ladies at the back have the roving mics if you put your hand up and uh, ask your question, identify yourself and ask your question. Marion, I'll, I'll kick off with you. I, uh, one of the things that, that I found probably the most, two, probably two points that I thought that were the most salient, I think, was firstly we have a generation of youngsters who've grown up, sort of graduated from university and had a, a fantastic cracking 20 years. Um, but now they're probably within that group that were living up to their income, not protecting, not, were not sort of preparing for that rainy day. And they're in that group that say a 5% increase in cost of livings will send, the, you know, send their household finances into disarray. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that all of us are guilty of living to the income that we get. But many of us in, the, in society understand that there are boom and bust. And so, you know, the, these young people that have never experienced uh, retrenchment in their household and, and, and losing one income um, and the 18% mortgages of, you know, many years ago. So they're probably very ill-equipped to deal with it. And Lisa and I were talking before, even if one of the big outgoings is their mortgage payment and they're thinking, well, actually, I'll downsize. There's not any product to go to. So there's not a lot of levers within the household themselves that can help boost you know, Job opportunities are scarce, more people are applying for the same jobs. Um, and we heard during radio this morning that uh, women are going back to work at a greater rate uh, to support the family. Uh, and that's having some contention as well. So you know, women worried about being away from their families and men feeling that they don't have the status that they used to have as the primary breadwinner. So we've got a lot going on in our households at the moment. Lisa, uh, talking about households, how is the housing market, that's obviously a really good indication of how healthy an economy is, how is the housing market as far as sales is concerned at the moment? Well, not to put too much of a dampener on things, we're certainly in a challenging environment from the residential uh, property market perspective. Um, in the last 12 months, we saw house prices come off around 3.7%. We've seen some stabilisation in the amount of stock in the marketplace, which is actually a good sign that things are starting to look like they're levelling out. Uh, the rental market remains hideously challenging, unfortunately, and that's really a direct result of the fact that our population growth has slowed significantly since this, this whole bust um, situation has arisen. So um, the housing market is, is facing some significant challenges. And 
what, we, what uh, Mary and I were talking about earlier is that there's just not the choice that we need. You know, the housing market is skewed to have bigger houses. The unit market is skewed to have smaller units. We're missing what, well, what's being called these days the missing middle. And, and what we need to do is encourage policy levers that make housing affordable, appropriate and accessible so that everyone can be part of that continuum. Jay, what about the banking industry? How have you seen things change in recent years? So one of the biggest lead indicators of um, household pain is credit card debt. And across the banking industry, credit card debt is at its highest point. And what, what's driven that is a majority of people love the points, run up the credit card, pay it off at the end of the month, go back to a zero balance. Those payments aren't happening to get it back to a zero balance to the level they were previously. And we're also seeing, um, especially in WA, a 24% increase in the number of hardship cases for, um, for the mortgage loan, for the consumer loan. That's across all the banks and looking for um, a moratorium on uh, repayments, um, an interest-free, uh, an interest-only period. We don't do interest-free yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we will be. The government probably would like us to. <laughs> um, and, and what we're seeing there too is what's really restricted is as the, the housing values have fallen, the capacity or the flexibility to do more with your repayments and how you wish to structure your debt has become restricted as well. So there's some forces that are definitely working against, including... Um, uh, the uh, level of wages, wages have dropped. Um, we were at, a, uh, at, at, a, at an unsustainable level driven by the mining industry and what was going on through the heady days of five or six years. All wages, no matter whether they be public, private or um, associated with retail even, um, those wages did go up. Those wages have now um, been restricted plus, you know, moving from full-time to part-time work, uh, contract work, contract work has its risks involved in it. Um, you're seeing more growth in the employment rates for part-time and contract than you are, obviously, full-time. Ian, the city of Wanneroo, obviously, they want to be, what, obviously, you want to be creating jobs. How are you working around that, given the economic times? You know, obviously, you want to drive performance, you want to set yourself up as a, as a place where people will go to live, where they can work in the region as well, so they're not travelling to and from a long distance at the time. How is the city dealing with the new economy? Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I'll wave a couple of flags early, um, representing uh, Economic Development Australia here today as a state practitioner and there's a few at the back of the room, so it's good to see them here. Um, and also City of Wanneroo for Economic Development. I guess I'd like to probably um, put a, a, a good spin on things in terms of uh, out of metro growth councils for Australia. Um, and obviously the City of Wanneroo is one of those, um, which represents about 5 million people around Australia and out of metro, and that's kind of anywhere between 30 and 60 k's out of a CBD. So... The, the interesting thing for us in the past and uh, historically as an industrial out of suburban um, economy was uh, construction, manufacturing, retail um, for a lot of the resident workers. And we have a population of over 200,000 now, which will probably double again by about 2040. So again, in terms of fast regional communities, there being this type of uh, effect is experienced all over Australia currently in terms of the public purse. Uh, and the expe expectations of community and business, that's where kind of the, the, the pain points um, are being felt by local government. The interesting things, um, uh, and we can talk about congestion from out of metro into CBDs, etc. but really the, the great thing for out of metro around Australia is the availability of land. And so the opportunity, and, and there's a long runway with economic development as well, so it's not just a quick win and, and you get a sugar hit and then you know, things are good for folks. So what we're trying to look at is obviously future economies in terms of being better beyond a boom uh, and smoothing out the kind of the troughs. Um, if it's clean technologies or if it's um, our agribusiness sector, which is uh, historically Wanneroo and Outer Metro, um, or um, advanced manufacturing, precision manufacturing, the types of uh, people that we're dealing with in Wanneroo at the moment and this is, goes the same for Swan and Armadale and, and all of the out of metro growth, 
is that the people are now interested in their kind of uplift of their skills um, development. So in that way, um, yes, there's the congestion problem and, and obviously through our advocacy campaigns, we're trying to get rail and road and telco, so all the foundation infrastructure set for Outer Metro. And even in Sean's um, speech, he said, if you do things ahead of time and in a Keynesian type of way and you understand that the economy's tentacles are going to spread into the regions, Jinjin, Dandaragon, beyond, then um, the, to us, and uh, clearly I'm biased, but the only game in town is looking at where the kind of the resource space is, whether it's clean tech or agri-tech or whatever, and then understanding that while there are financial instruments that drive this from a CBD point of view, there's a better play and a, an interesting investment play outside of, of CBD. So we're happy. Sean, this is a bit of a curly one. Um, you said that uh, the economy as it is now is the new normal. Um, do you get any feeling as to when we might go back to some moderate growth? Look, I, I'm not entirely sure from a, a growth perspective when that, uh, when that growth will resume to what we've found to be a recent trend. Uh, the reality is that our economic growth hasn't actually dipped into the negative territory. It's just slowed, so it feels like it's a recession, not that it actually is. And the, the great thing that we do see in a lot of our, uh, our results is that there are pockets where sentiment is returning. Uh, amongst those higher income households, there are a lot of them that are feeling quite positive about the future. They're sitting on their money, but they are feeling quite positive about their, uh, about their future. What we see is at the, the lower end of the market in, in lower income households, um, where we've got a level, of, uh, a level of pain being experienced, we need to find solutions for those guys. So what that means for economic growth, I think we're still in a positive, uh, a positive place, but it's just going to take some time for, uh, for that sentiment to turn around. Lisa, based on that, are you seeing that houses at the lower end of the market, the lower than the, maybe the median price, are they selling quicker or are things really tight still out there and sales taking a while? Yeah, Tony, it's very interesting. I was looking at the data this morning just in case I got asked a question about sale by price range analysis. So I can quite confidently tell you <laughs> that um, in the housing market, so established, established residential houses, about 50% of house sales in the year to March this year have occurred under 500k. Our current median on the quarter of March this year is around 510, 511. Settlements are still coming through, so that'll etch up a little bit over the next few weeks. Um, so there's still a lot of purchasing at that price range. There's actually almost 50% of stock at that price range as well. So there's no shortage of houses in that price range. The problem is, is that the the bulk, nearly 70% of the stock that's there is for three and four bedroom houses. So that's what I was saying earlier, it's, it's skewed to the, to, to the larger home. So we're still not creating the opportunities for, you know, say single person households or two people households who want to buy a house but not a three or four bedroom property. There's not that opportunity. Um, so we're certainly seeing, uh, we're certainly seeing that happen in, in the current market. Marion, one of the other interesting facts was the exodus. Uh, as a former Sydney sider, you, uh, you've, you've said yourself that many people who come here are here for a good time, not for a long time, and as soon as the downturn, or as soon as the economy it turns downwards, they, they leave. 3,000 a month, that's, they're quite shocking figures. They are quite shocking figures, I agree. And um, I think it's good that our international migrants that came for business reasons are really wanting to stay because they can see the very high quality of life. And, um, you know, the... The sense that um, Sydney and Melbourne particularly are having an infrastructure and construction-led boom, people are thinking that there's more opportunities and real wages growth over there, they're probably right. So, you know, there, there is the opportunity on the East Coast. I will say that uh, in, a, in the context of they've had no real wages growth for 10 years on the East Coast. Uh, I've been to a number of conferences this year as part of the Bigger and Better Beyond the Boom project and the cost of utilities and the lack of real wages growth have been two issues discussed in business and local government forums. Okay. Happy to take some questions from the floor. Anyone uh, have a question for the panel? It's all right. We were completely stunned when we had our briefing over this data as well. There's just <laughs> so much in it. 
Jay, with the thoughts about people having to work longer, um, probably myself included, you know, I could be kicking on until 75 and things like that, um, does that become problematic for banks when you're looking to finance a loan or when you're looking to give some, somebody some money because we are so used to, you know, sort of saying, okay, it's a 25-year loan, you should probably have paid that up by the time you're 55 or 65 or, or 70 at least, but, you know, do, do, you see, foresee, do you foresee problems in the future? I think there's already a change in thinking around the um, the duration of loans and, you know, we, we don't have issues at the moment, nor should we, um, any of the banks, if, for argument's sake, a 50-year-old mature male, slightly older like myself, uh, goes in and applies for a loan, they're not restricted to a five or six-year loan, it's now, well, what, what is realistically, you know, your career and what are you wanting to do? and they tailor it accordingly. So gone is the time where you've got a 30-year-old, um, you can have a 25-year loan because you're going to retire at 55. I think the whole market's changed and, and you've seen the return to work programs and I, and I commend filling the pool again, Marianne, around, you know, the, it's realistic now that, that the labour market has changed significantly and old thought policies needed to adapt with it and, and the return to work cycles that are being put into place now to facilitate that um, is, is premium, is a premium and is what will win market share. And you saw that with um, Alan Joyce the other day when he was talking around a lot of stuff that Qantas has put into place to make them a leading, leading employee choice. Ian, what is the city of Wanneroo, what are your thoughts around automation? And there were some fairly frightening figures that 34% of people thought that they probably could have their job done by a robot. When you're looking forward, when you're projecting the sort of industries you want to bring into the city of Wanneroo, how do you figure automation into that? I guess um, uh, the risk of sounding like a sales pitch, I guess um, recently we had an uh, industrial survey of our Wangara, which is Landcorp, um, run in the past over the last 25 years. It's been in Wangara. It's they finally closed the chapter of land sales there. And in terms of the thousand businesses that employ about 15,000 people, um, we got to kind of meet a, a bunch of uh, the headquarter CEOs or, or, or a group of company chair people. And what they were telling us is that obviously, again, uh, you ride the wave of mining services and oil and gas, etc., and services to mining. Um, because that's uh, the function of industrial estate. What they've found is that their headcount, while it's shrinking, their, and their pipeline certainly has, had driven up in terms of, uh, uh, dried up in terms of sales, they were still getting a reasonable net rev um, position for the ones that were able to go into other markets. So um, whether it was fabrication or whether it was re-engineering, um, whether it was a little bit of offshoring and then reshoring, um, the, the, the savvy ones, or whether the ones that had the government uh, contracts, uh, and Ertec uh, springs to mind um, in, in Wangara, they were quite they were quite buoyant um, about the ability then to to push headcount up when it's needed. So in terms of just in time um, uh, personnel, and in terms of fitting to the supply needs. Yes, there was some pain, clearly. There were, there were certain um, contractors that were looking at rail infrastructure projects, for example, a couple of years ago that had to shrink in size. And, and, and we all know in terms of industrial developments, the first to go up, the last to kind of make good. But, um, you know, the, the, from what we're seeing, um, well, Landcorp can speak for themselves, but there's certainly new interest in trying to customise opportunities for um, and whether automation takes, uh, you know, takes a percentage out of that. There, there's still some uplift, um, or at least the, the green shoots that we're seeing at the moment in our metro. Sean, were you surprised by the fact that 40% of the people that you spoke to had suffered some sort of career disruption? For me, that's quite staggering. As I said, we all probably know somebody who has had to retrain or been made redundant or had a career change over that time. Were you surprised by that figure? Yeah, look, I, uh, it's, a, it's an extremely high figure. So if you look at the level of disruption at, ha at a household level in the course of the last 10 years, it's far higher than, than what we would typically see. Even if you look at the comparison base between those industries that were unaffected and those industries that were affected, it was a multiplier of two to, to three times. So it has been an extraordinary period of upheaval in the, the WA economy. It's not normal. And even though we do tend to get these, uh, these trends of boom and bust, 
the last 10 years has been a particularly aggressive uh, period of change. Any questions from the floor, please? Thank you, uh, Sue Boyd. Uh, thank you very much. It was a, it's a terrific piece of work you've done and extremely useful. Um, in Terralia, I work as an executive business coach. And I have to say, last year, we had almost no clients. Everybody was worried, everybody was nervous, companies were buckling up. Um, we coach at the A to C levels in, in business. I have to tell you that this year, that's turned around and we have quite a lot of work coming in. And uh, what we think that indicates is that businesses have realized that this is the new reality. It's not going to change, and their responsibility is to run their businesses as well as they can in the, in the current circumstances. And they're very aware of disruption, and they're very aware of the challenges coming over the hill towards them. And so I just wanted to share that, because I think that is an indicator um, different from the ones that you've been using, but complementary, to show that things actually are moving forward and people, people are taking account of the facts that surround us. Thank you. Another question? Deidre? Oh, sorry, at the back. Oh, hi. I'm Helen Shield from the West. Marion and Lisa, I was interested in what you thought might be the potential policy levers to actually encourage people to meet the demand in the missing housing middle? So you're talking this? about the availability of two bigger houses? Yeah, of course. Yeah, Helen, it's a really, it's a massive issue and this is a policy area that REWA, you know, consistently for a number of years has talked about. I think there are some really key issues that need to be addressed and the first one's around affordability and transaction costs. So transfer duty as a, as a tax for raising revenue to provide services we all know is inefficient, we all know is not the most economical way of actually ensuring sustainable revenues. It actually impacts people's ability to move number one. So it creates a massive issue on mobility and also on lifestyle change. So it's not just about first home buyers trying to get into the market, it actually impacts trade up buyers, it impacts people who want to right size into a lifestyle property that, that better meets their needs, whether that be downsizing or, or something by the beach or, or, in, or, in, or down south. So the first issue I think that, that the government really needs to look at and all policy makers need to look at is how can we reduce transaction costs but still ensure that there's a revenue source that can come through to government to, to make sure we can still provide essential services and that's what was coming through in the research that um, Sean shared with us today is that there's some big challenges that we need to grasp from a policy perspective that take a lot of political capital and will that we are at a point now where we need to start talking about it. The other area that's also dear to Rewa's strategic policy thoughts around property is planning and development reform. So we've got a fantastic policy um, framework with Directions 2031, with Perth and Peel at 3.5 million, and we set some really aggressive infill targets. It's not just about high rise. Not everyone wants to live in an apartment that's you know, 30 storeys or bigger. So that's what I was talking about earlier, Helen, is the, the, choice, the choice issue. We're not actually bringing to market what people want at those different stages of the housing continuum in terms of where you are. So we're not short of ideas, like we're not short of, of, of levers. You know, obviously land supply is another issue. So we're not short of, poly we're not actually constricted. The issue is, is that we really need to start looking at a whole of government approach and, and start to understand if we shift one component, even if it's incremental shift, we're not talking transformational because the budget doesn't allow for that to happen at this particular point in time. But if we actually look at incremental changes that will, that will create improvements in the system, but make sure that they're linked across all those different portfolio areas, then we can start actually talking about making some meaningful reform in an environment that's fiscally challenging. So Helen, from my perspective, um, most cities in Australia are struggling with this missing middle. It's a topic that policymakers turn their attention to all the time. So moving people back into the city is very easy because you don't have any near neighbours that you're going to annoy with your high rise towers but it's going into those more urban village settings and trying to put in medium style density into existing neighbourhoods where we've got you know, very much a community backlash which then has an effect on the, on, on the politicians who lose their nerve. So 
I agree with Lisa that uh, it's a whole of government, but probably plus a whole of community conversation Most about definitely. how do we how do we house the future population in an affordable way, because that median mid, missing middle median density type product will be more affordable than having your own terra firma. Deirdre, did you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Deirdre Wilmot from the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Western Australia. And thank you for the presentation. That was uh, really very interesting. Um, I just really wanted to confirm uh, Sue Boyd's uh, comments with uh, the results of our latest uh, business expectation survey, which um, show that 70% of businesses think that the next 12 months will be better or at least the same, uh, which is a sizeable increase on the last quarter. So that's the most recent quarter survey. So we've seen steady increase over the last um, 18 months to two years, but uh, um, but that it's it's consistently improving. So I think uh, we, we we can really. Uh, say that we the other the other good news in there in the context of this survey is that hiring intentions are increasing. So um, hopefully that will start to translate into greater confidence about uh, people's own um, job security and uh, disposable income. Uh, but just turning to your presentation, Sean. Are we really seeing a perfect storm of the end of our major resources projects coinciding with all those demographic changes and changes in technology and changes in the way we're working? How much were th was the uncertainty that you were seeing really part of a worldwide phenomenon rather than something that is specific to us? I think a lot of what we are, what we are seeing is just about the now. Um, it's not about the future and it's not about these other, other trends that are actually occurring. The thing that I think has tended to happen is that people, are, from a, a consumer perspective, people are focused on what they see out there right now and their perceptions and their sentiments are rather dour right now and they will tend to lag where business sentiment tends to move. So things will get better and I, I don't want, uh, want this presentation to be a, uh, a statement about it's all negative. I think there's lots of green shoots uh, out there. The stuff that we see uh, in terms of the, the, the trends that we need to think about now, they're, they're a very, very slow train coming. We've been able to see those things in, the, few, in, in the, um, the distance for probably the last 20 or 30 years. The thing is, with the, the boom in place, our attentions have gone elsewhere. So I don't think that you've got a, a, a coalescing of a lot of difficult factors right now. You've got the end of the boom, and then you've got a, a requirement to really change focus to reflect the fact that there are other things happening out there that we need to, to make sure are factored into our policies. And they are long time coming, but they will be very disruptive to the traditional models we've had for revenue and services. Could I just pick up on that green shoots point, um, Tony? Um, Deirdre, you're absolutely right. If I just look at our industry in real estate, 2016 has been described by our members as the worst year in 30, 40 years. We've seen a significant amount of small businesses close or, or resize. We've seen a lot, of, a lot of staff leave, you know, sales reps leave the industry. But what's been really positive, even though we finished off last year with a decline in house prices of 3.7%, we've actually seen significantly higher levels of activity in the first three months of this year compared to the same time last year. So when my team and I look at the data and, and, and try to not call when the bottom of the market is happening, because we often get asked that, what I feel like at the moment is that we're actually sitting at a point where things seem to be stabilising, things are improving, and in our industry where we're constantly being disrupted by new technology, you know, it's really important for us to be able to respond in that, in that environment. And if I can just talk about the four stages of Boomtown attitudes, so this might be instructive. So having a look at Boomtowns elsewhere, the first stage is called enthusiasm. Everyone's really excited because there's a sense that things are improving and we get all excited about all the opportunity. And the second stage is called uncertainty because things start to change. So if you think back even to the congestion issue of 10 years ago, the freeway started to feel full, the trains were at crush capacity, etc., etc., etc. So we were having those real growing pains. The third part is called um, near panic. 
and it's where most people turn to government and say, you haven't planned well for the future and this is why we're in the state that we're in. And the final stage is called adaptation and resilience and we didn't get there. We didn't have the pain long enough in Perth to start to adapt to what it felt like to be different. And I think that's a real shame in a way. It would have been great to go through those four cycles, but I think being in the period we're in now, we're going to have a much more sense of how do we innovate our way out of this, how do we be more collegiate and cooperative, and how does all of us have a role to play in the solutions rather than turning our attention to government and saying you need to fix this. Any questions from the floor? Uh, yes, Debbie Tarrant-Link from the City of Wanneroo. Um, Marion's probably um, touched a little on this issue, but I was quite interested in the figures you had around the fragile or households that are in fragile situations and we need to build their resilience. Um, given that it seems that potentially some of those households didn't really benefit overly from the boom, I'm just wondering if you've looked at the you know particular strategies for how we bring those households along as we move forward um, to you know, whatever the next boom might be or whatever the new environment is likely to be? Well, I can't say that we're at the solution stage yet, but certainly there is a, diff a geographic difference. Um, so if you're looking in, in the inner, Perth inner, in the statistical area of Perth inner, people are more positive generally and they don't feel they felt the stress as much. But certainly overall and in the Peel region particularly, which is our, I think our little Petri dish, um, people are feeling very disenfranchised. So I think it's a real challenge for government to think about even increasing utilities prices one iota because what's going to be the effect on household, let alone if we have a change uh, in, in interest rates. Um, you know, God help the days of 18%. Um, so, you know, we, we've got to get into solutions mode as this project develops and, you know, this information is very new to us. But it, I think that was one of the most striking things, that it's all like we didn't even put any money away for the future. We were just living to the top of our means and maybe even extending ourselves. Um, can I just add, um, I guess uh, there's a bit of a sleeping giant around um, Perth, Metro and Greater Perth. Um, in the other than mainly English-speaking um, cultural ethnicities. And Wanneroo is blessed with about 50, 60 different kind of ethnicities, but equally about 16% of our population comes from that sort of background. So in terms of kind of very micro-interventionist economic development, um, even when we kind of open things up for migrants, skilled migrants, and this is, we're talking um, educational attainment is of, of standard, um, at uh, bachelor or master's, a whole ton of folks come out and say, how can I engage? And what we're finding, I guess, even with the Vietnamese and the Slavic uh, and, and all sorts of um, denominations we have, is that they actually have their own business enclave and they have their own business supply chain. And what we haven't tapped into, because don't forget a lot of these people, that, whether it's Southern Sudan or whether it's from the Middle East or whether it's from wherever, uh, Central Asia, they are very, very quick and very clever at adaptation. So in terms of startups or microenterprise or social enterprise or just some of that community resilience that gives uplift in terms of, because they know how to survive. So they know how to eat, they know how to kind of pay bills, they know how to go and, and use kind of traditional means to get by. And what we're finding in our communities, and we've got um, kind of hubs in the south that we're going to pop up, we're doing going to do things in the north, we're finding that people are coming out and telling us we're ready to do things. The, the, the engagement level um, at chambers of commerce or business associations is poor. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's male-dominated white, um, 40 to 65, and a lot of those folks won't come into the room. So in terms of giving that ability for this state to engage with a kind of a dormant uh, business sector that for all intents and purposes kind of sticks to itself and has internal consumption, the export orientation of that, and this is no secret, this is a Silicon Valley thing, this is Indian engineers going into San Francisco, whatever. The point is that we don't do enough in terms of whether it's a policy mechanism, whether it's a, um, our budgets, uh, government or other, um, to engage. So, we're, again, that's, that's something if you talk about being better beyond a boom, there's a kind of not an easy win or a quick win, but it's something that we need to do more with. So I spend a lot of time up in Singapore and Malaysia, and the one thing that... Victoria has done, the Victorian government, and it shouldn't be government-led anyway, 
but what Victoria has done so well is how they have marketed their education and their, their tourism into those markets. And they see their next great opportunity being Vietnam because Vietnamese, um, the, the middle class continues to grow, wanting education in, in and Australia appeals to them for where we're located and for, for both our safety and our, our political situation. One of the great advantages that we've got over the next few years, I believe, is that, that no matter what your political position is, we're going to have a government with a majority that should be starting to think about eight years, because which will be a change, because too often now we've had fiscal policy that's very short-sighted and shorter term. Um, we've got an Asian uh, community that wants to invest. S the um, second highest population of Singaporeans is in Perth, in the world, um, and they've all got money and they're looking for yield. And their yield at five or six percent they think is sensational, where Australian business, etc., and investors have always thought a lot higher than that, um, and they are investing, whether it be in agriculture, whether it be in uh, tourism, whether it be in shopping centres, etc. And what they are doing is they're bringing um, low levels of debt and looking to take a long-term position. So they're actually taking the lead on a longer-term position for the market, which will create opportunities for us as, as, as a state. Question from over there, thanks. Um, Erica Haddon, RACWA. I think you almost went to answering my question um, because obviously all of this, <coughs> excuse me, is talking about how disruption is upon us and that the fact that the wider population is feeling firsthand what's been coming for quite a long time. So my question was, what are the big industries you see us pursuing? And I think you've already touched on them. You know, tourism, is it education, is it medical tourism? So I'm interested to hear from the panel because while people can, um, you know, they're disrupted now and they're going, I know that my current jobs are not going to be there, they need to have some sort of light on the hill to at least know where to face. They don't necessarily know, and none, none of us know what the, all the detailed skills are that they're going to need, but they at least need to have some idea about what those big um, industries might be. So, interested to hear the panel's views on what they think they might be. So, what the research tells us is that, uh, that, that it's a story about the sectors that are up and down. So, the sectors that think they're going to go ahead and leaps and bounds are education and healthcare. And the, the trends are certainly feeding into, um, in, into those from a demographic perspective. There's massive disruption that's going to, to generate training opportunities. There's massive ageing that's going to generate healthcare opportunities. So there's certainly two of the industries that will benefit. And uh, um, we certainly believe that there's a phenomenal opportunity around automation in whatever industry. So one of the things about being in Western Australia is, and being remote is the global investment that goes into automation can just as easily happen here because it's not about um, people on the ground, it's about ideas and technology being able to be exploited at a local level. So we can lead that out of Perth as easily as we can elsewhere. Um, certainly mining and, and construction are also um, very buoyant. Those, the, the people that are left in those industries feel that they're going to grow and can see continuing opportunities. And the really interesting part about that is a lot of them are younger. And, um, and that's a, a bit of a, a function of the, the shake-up that's occurred. So if I was to place my bets based on what I can see in the, um, in the research, it's those sorts of spaces. So we're also seeing great opportunities with smart technology. Um, and, uh, and the other one that has got great appeal and is still working through the logistics of it all is um, retirement for successful Asian business people. They love our climate, they love the conditions that we live in, they love the space. Um, there's, a, there's a strong market there and we're, we're starting to see some major investors and you know, uh, major suppliers out of Asia looking. I know the Swan Valley's had some discussions with um, a couple of providers that are looking for, you know, to build cities, retirement cities. And that would be a major increase in those areas to, to, to disposable incomes. They all come um, with sizeable retirement funds. 
that will be a big market. And are you seeing any trends as far as the industries you think are, are picking up in the city of Wanneroo? I guess um, having uh, the good fortune in the past of uh, living in Japan and working for the industrial conglomerate for Tokyo Corporation, um, now obviously more than ever for um, Outer Metro with uh, the uh, McGowan Safiotti line to, uh, to Yanchip, the Butler Yanchip rail extension, uh, and I'm grinning as much as I can because it's obviously wonderful when you're in the wilderness for so long. But uh, the Tokyo Corporation, $100 billion under a market cap, um, ridiculously diversified, um, obviously rail, hotel, um, owned part of Japan Airlines before, brought private rail into town centre, into city centres, and again, um, we had the good fortune of uh, Professor Severo, Robert Severo came out for a job summit that we did end of last year, and he said if you can land... Um, obviously trunk infrastructure somewhere, and, but then you build the capital portfolio above ground. Um, Tokyo is incredibly talented at doing this, and yeah, whether it's stranded capital, whether it's patient capital, uh, after their buying um, spree from Alan Bond 40 years ago, they're finally looking at now the deployment above ground. Again, this goes back to um, transport at 3.5, uh, obviously um, strategic metropolitan centres. But really, if we think that uh, folks want to live um, above and below a train station, and if we actually figure out how to do transit-oriented development, as they do in Asia and in Japan, and living in Japan for four years, I never got in a car. I didn't need to. Um, it brings people into and out of capital opportunities. So the, the interesting thing for Tokyo, and they've even got a bell service. It's called Tokyo Bell. And if there are retirees that live between the fifth and the tenth floor, and they need groceries from B3 up to the second floor, they hit the bell, really, and their automated service uh, um, order gets their groceries delivered. If they want allied health care, well, then they just hit their bell. So the Tokyo Bell Service kind of figures out that you buy cradle to grave from the Tokyo group of companies. So what I'm hopeful of is that this uh, wholly owned subsidiary um, with the Anship Beach Joint Venture um, to see the Yanship Rail station delivered by the McGowan government 2019-2020 uh, allows us to understand kind of edge city development in decent kind of opportunity where whether you're uh, you know a graduate or whether you're somebody involved in the supply chain of clean technology whatever it is or your retiree that these places at the end of corridors and out of metro are no longer pariahs so we're excited in terms of the deployment of this international capital. They've done it forever, since 1950s. They kind of had new towns, um, uh, as Severo's talked to us about, from 1950, uh, which was Edge City back in those days, out of Tokyo. So, yeah, in terms of that, City of Wanneroo is extremely excited about also Lend Lease Land Corp down the, down the line, on, on the Yanship line. And, Tony, I just wanted to add that... In the pre-election period, both sides of politics said that uh, tourism and uh, higher education would be sort of new frontiers, and that's why we've dedicated some resources to actually understanding what some of the barriers are to realising uh, getting more international students here. And the tourism one is under development, but it's, it's a similar thing. It's about marketing the destination as a place with lots of things to do. Uh, and not just marketing the experiences, but more of this urban experience. And I think that's what Melbourne does so much better than us. We, we market the natural environment, which of course is beautiful and we all love it, but we have to market more than that uh, to get over some of the barriers. There are so many American tourists that just want their picture taken outside the front of the Opera House and we have to create that moment for them too. I remember, Marion, when the latest fact base was released and looked into international students coming to study in, in Western Australia, um, the Vice-Chancellors all saw the report, read the report, and they weren't surprised. Do you think that they now realise there are some really easy, low-hanging fruit that they could be taking advantage of? Uh, no, they weren't surprised. They happened to all be in India together on the same day when our piece of research was launched, so they had an intense discussion over, over the work. So no, there was no surprises for them, but I think an independent organisation like Committee for Perth putting up what some of the issues are to get a greater share of higher education kind of rallied them a bit. Uh, and at least now the information is public and we all understand what we need to do. One of the things that you as employers can do is people with English as a second language who study here as international students really struggle to get a work placement and some of them need to do a practicum to complete their four-year degree. And they're saying we're just getting overlooked time and time again. 
And word of mouth is one of the biggest uh, ways of getting more international students here. So even if they do have a good experience at the university and they get a quality education, if they can't get that work placement and feel that they're being overlooked because English isn't their first language, they go home and they, they tell that experience and therefore it's harder for us to get that, that share of students. So, you know, as employers really think about what you can do uh, to facilitate uh, having our international students study and have a great experience all the way through the process. Lisa, um, obviously housing construction is a really, uh, you know, we're looking at the things that the industries that can take off, has an incredible trickle down effect. You said that the first three months of this year have been very successful. Do you think that's one of the levers as the first homeowners grant has helped that along? So we don't collect a lot of data on the new build part of the industry, but what I can share with you looking at ABS data and, and seeing trends in building approvals and dwelling commencements, they've come off in a, a massive high that we experienced over the last few years during you know, the most recent people boom. The first homeowner grant certainly has helped and you know, whilst as a policymaker and economist I don't like the idea of grants and subsidies and vouchers and things like that, the, the grant creates this incentive and, and, and it's... And it's it just, it means that, you know, when you're a household, a first-time household wanting to purchase, if you can get a, a foothold with an extra 10 or 15K, you're not going to, to say no to that. Um, it certainly comes down to choice, you know. By not having a first homeowner's grant for the established market means that we're actually creating a perverse outcome by encouraging people to, to go and build a new home. And most places where they build a new home is in is in the outskirts where we don't have all the infrastructure, we don't have all the essential services. So we're actually making things less livable when what we're trying to do is actually create an environment where people want to stay in WA and not, not get teased out by those greener pastures that the research was saying. And I've won, I'm one of the ring-ins who have stayed. But, you know, I think it's... It, government policy is at the point now where we're, we really need to start looking at all of our options. And REWA does research consistently around, you know, do we need to look at the first home buyer concession um, that you get for transfer duty? Do we need to look at reintroducing a grant? You know, how can we help the government look at ways to make incremental changes to reform that will actually assist the budget and help us to get better outcomes for the community as a whole? Would what are your thoughts be for downsizing, given, given our ageing population, people who downsize maybe 65 plus, uh, a rebate or a, a deduction on oh, stamp most duty? definitely. Yeah, most definitely. We went to the, the last election with a, with a joint campaign position with the Council on the Ageing um, of WA, and that was to look at an exemption for transfer duty for, uh, for people wanting to right-size, because it's not just about moving into a smaller property, it's actually about a lifestyle decision as well. And basically, you know, if we look at a median house price of around $510,000, $511,000, stamp duty is approximately eighteen grand, give or take. That's a significant amount of money. If you were, say, to offer a $10,000 concession, which is the current policy we're talking to government about with at the moment, you'd still earn some transfer duty revenue as, as Treasury on, on that median house price. Um, but then when, when people go and, and buy that bigger house, they're also making transfer duty receipts on, on the trade-up activity. So to me, it's a no-brainer. We certainly need to look at how we can help people reshape their lifestyles and live the life that they want to live in their older years, absolutely. And I think, you know, we can do some tinkering around the edges to help facilitate that. But, but key to all that is we need to make sure we have the housing choice that the people actually want. And I think at the moment, that's the bit that's actually missing. We don't have the medium density, we don't have the townhouses, we don't have the small group dwellings that people want to be able to live in. Any questions from the floor? Thank you. Hi, uh, yes, thank you very much and thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Stephanie Stroud and I am a councillor for the city of Subiaco. Um, I'm very passionate about economic development. I believe that um, local government actually see it at the coalface. We see the impact on our businesses and we see it on our residents. But I believe local government is very ill-equipped to deal with it. We're expected to be good planners we're expected to be good service providers, but when about 
economics and, and, and economic development, we're very, you know, we're, we're very ill-prepared. Um, I believe we should have an economic vision and I agree that it's a very long-term vision as well. Um, but I'm just interested in your comments on that. Thank you. And I, I might add, I'm personally very passionate about economic development, but I am fighting it an uphill um, battle at the local government level. Thank you. I think that's the whole reason why we're doing bigger and better beyond the boom. So each local government authority has its own economic development plan. They're very varied and they don't roll up into the whole for the region. Uh, and the state obviously has an economic development plan for the state and we just see a gap for the metropolitan region and that's why we're doing this project. We want to do it in a very stealthful way because if you read the economic development plans of other major capitals, they all seem a bit me too. And, you know, Perth is a special place and it's got some uh, strengths and it's got some opportunities that it needs to seize and that's why we really want to do the research over a considered period of time. But importantly, put people at the heart of the issue by doing the survey and understanding how, how people feel as well as what the data is telling us. Ian, do you have any thoughts around that? Uh, just to connect you with uh, Mark Holdsworth, the National Chair of Economic Development Australia at the back of the room, City of Canning. So there's a, a plug for Economic Development Australia. And uh, just to say that, yeah, we feel the pain of um, people who are not uh, well resourced for economic development at the local government level. But equally, it's about getting into the business community, as we know. S Subiaco has um, kind of unique challenges um, with the business community, so we, we're aware of those. But, um, yeah, the folks just behind you on that table would love to talk to you, I'm sure. And just to pick up um, a couple of points there, it's not about government solving the problem. I mean, I've spent a long time working in government in Victoria. I've now been in, in WA and working in industry associations for half a decade. It's about the business community and industry coming to the table as well because we all need to solve the problems that are facing the community. And the work that's going to be undertaken through this project is just so fundamentally important for us setting up a plan going forward so that we don't end up getting to the next boom bus cycle and going, oh, well, we haven't learnt anything or we haven't done anything differently. And I think, you know, it's, it's wonderful leadership that the Committee for Perth has taken the initiative to, to, to run this type of strategic policy piece. Any questions from the floor? Uh, thank you. Hello, Suzanne Arda. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the conversation. It's quite sobering, I have to say. I wanted to pick up on Jay's point earlier about that international engagement. Um, you know, Perth is uniquely provided and, and situated to really take advantage of the ASEAN, the biggest, you know, growing community in the world. Are you seeing, Sean, in the survey, or did you ask the question about international engagement, um, you know, having a, taking the, the opportunities that it present themselves, or is that going to be some ongoing work? Because I feel we are in such a unique position and I don't believe we sometimes take advantage of the opportunities that are, that are there in the Asian region. So l looking at, uh, at international opportunities wasn't something that we actually did. It was focused very much on what's happening in the here and now in Perth and Peel. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot to, uh, to give to that other than um, a lot of hope. And I, I do think that the geographic location of Western Australia means that we have all sorts of opportunities within the region. Whenever you do these sorts of studies, you do realise what a diverse population we do have here in Western Australia and how rapidly it is growing. And as it grows and as it looks to, uh, to other parts of the world uh, to take advantage of some of the oppor opportunities that may exist in the future, part of that's got to be in Asia. So the report that we're going to release at the end of the year is sizing the economy and it's going to look at our global connectivity which will then lead to this uh, advantageous spot that we have and I think we've been talking about it in Perth for a decade now and how do we actually go about realising that um, so that Melbourne gets more in of the international student market than we do yet we're closer to them, we've got longer term trading relationships and probably more of a... Um, a history of being together as people, but uh, Melbourne is, is the place of choice, so we've got to m work much harder at positioning ourselves better. Any more questions? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, can I, I just add something, because Suzanne, you've done it exceptionally well, um, and it is, you've got to put yourself in their shoes and understand what they want. Um, I, I was so frustrated with some of the meetings I've had with with government looking to Asia, etc., and it is around, well, this is what we think they want and this is the way we should do it and this is going to be a vision statement. We're missing the most important piece. It is what is going to get 
those um, nationalities and those people wanting to come to Australia and wanting to work with us. Um, and it's got to be out of their eyes, not our eyes. Um, and you've done it exceptionally well to understand, well, what is the market and what can I do to support that market? Um, that's one of the biggest issues. And I, that's why I love surveys, because you're actually getting it from the, the, the people that will make a difference, the people that can change. Because standing here and talking about it just won't get it done. And Marion, that was one of the things from the last uh, fact-based report as well about international students was that we need to see what they want through their eyes. If we're going to bring them to Western Australia to study, we need to actually understand what it is their, their study experience is going to be as well. That was a very point, uh, blunt, bluntly made point, wasn't it? It was, and uh, I, you know, my bluntly made point back is that Melbourne's been working at this really hard and very genuinely, uh, and we have not, because we've had a boom and that's distracted us. And I think that's something I remember Justin Carroll and I, we had a conversation um, about this and it was essentially, Justin, you said that during the boom times, everybody is so busy, you don't have time to reflect beyond that and what happens tomorrow because we are working so hard and we're just barely getting by with the sort of unsustained growth that we had. But um, hopefully, um, bigger, better beyond the boom will give us some breathing space. We have the breathing space now to uh, come around and, and to say, okay, let's look at how we, uh, how we make sure that we don't have this awful boom bust cycle continue, which it has done for decades. So, any more questions? I'd like to thank all the panellists today. Jay Watson from Westpac, Ian Martinez from the City of Wanneroo, Sean Griffin from Ipsos and Lisa Kazalak from Rewa. Thank you very much for your very interesting, informed points of view and uh, your feedback on the, the survey presentation as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, Tony Monaghan um, please put your head to hands together. Uh, in my experience, a, a panel chair can really make or break a, a panel, and I think certainly in this case, uh, Tony has certainly made it. So please thank Tony. Uh, when I saw the email come out from the Committee for Perth uh, advertising this lunch, and I was, I was fast to book a table because I thought you know, the title, Beyond the Boom, How is Perth Faring? I thought that sounded pretty interesting. And uh, I wanted to hear Sean Griffin's and Ipsos's comments on how we're far faring as a city, as a state and as an economy, and really compare that to my own, my own experience. And I tell you what, uh, I've not been disappointed. We've heard from five experts in their field. And um, although the, it's not been any surprise to us that uh, it's not all beer and skittles out there, that the survey showed some pretty uh, sobering uh, results, but there are solutions out there as well. Uh, since the boom, we heard, we've heard, and uh, I'm sure a lot of us have, have experienced that, uh, in fact, one in five of us have been made redundant. 30% uh, of us have changed careers, in fact, and interestingly, as Sean pointed out, 72% of us uh, are not expecting any wages growth in the in the at, at the, uh, the current moment, but. Also, um, there's perhaps some indication of some economic diver uh, diversification going on out there as well, with relatively stronger sectors being found in the education, medical and tourism industries. So, how is the workforce changing? Well, uh, we've heard that uh, we're faced with some pretty confronting choices um, with respect to a declining workforce and declining uh, taxpayer base along with a ballooning uh, aged population and non-working uh, population. With respect to productivity, Sean pointed out uh, his favourite solution to saving product, uh, to, uh, to improving the productivity solution by exploiting our aged population and uh, by uh, encouraging our parents and grandparents to stay in the uh, in the workforce and my brothers and I are doing the best we can in that respect. <laughs> um, but also interestingly that there's been no real change in behaviours uh, since the, the boom and that interestingly there's no change or very little change in behaviours across the, uh, 
across the generations, which, which is very interesting. Um, and despite us all living longer, the official retirement age of 65 hasn't changed since the early 1900s. But so where does that leave us? Well, we've, uh, we need to uh, recalibrate our expectations. We need to build on our resilience, uh, refocus on structural shifts, and look for the productivity gains. And we need to, to tackle the difficult trade-offs. So not, not an easy uh, way forward, but uh, some real positive, real solutions out there for us. And we've heard all this today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, over some terrific food and wine, which is uh, from the ever-capable Hyatt Catering team. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure on your behalf and on behalf of the Committee for Perth to thank our panellists, Sean Griffin, Lisa Kazalak, Jay Watson, Ian Martinez, and of course, the committee's very own Marion Fulker. Uh, Marion's got gifts for each of the, uh, the panellists, and uh, so make sure that you don't leave without those. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Dr Richard Whaley for the rousing welcome uh, to country to begin with. So thank you to the Committee for Perth Chair, John Lancelot, uh, and also Marion and her team, Holly and, and uh, Madeline and others, uh, for another first class event today. And lastly, but most importantly, thank you ladies and gentlemen, uh, to you for your attendance, your questions and contributions. I hope you have a lovely day.